When I when I speak to some of my friends who are single and they're say they're over thirty five, they've really like never been in a relationship before. This, the things that they say as reasons for why they're not giving this person a chance are so unbelievably petty. Like I have one friend and she knows who she is. She's a really good friend of mine. She's been a good <laughs> friend of mine for more than a decade. Shout out to your friend. Yeah. Well, I was I was on her profile once and she told me that the reason she wasn't going to give this guy a chance on this dating app was because in the back of the picture that he, his display picture, he had boxes on top of his cupboard. Mm. And she was like, oh God, he's, he puts boxes on top of his cupboard. Like, so that's why she didn't right. give him a chance. So here's here's the thing. What happens is people look at dating profiles and are going through the apps. And I think, you know, men and women tend to do this a little bit differently. Men are like, am I attracted to this person? Swipe, which also doesn't necessarily work out for them. Like they're not really looking for who do I want to be with? And women do the opposite. They look at it at, you know, they'll look at all the pictures. They'll read everything that the person wrote as if, do I want to marry this person potentially or not? As opposed to, do I want to spend 45 minutes having coffee with this person? Mm -hmm. That's really different. And also on a first date, it's the same mentality where a lot of people think, oh, you know, like people will come in to therapy or even friends will say, you know, I went on this date. I had a good time. It was fun. I just, I don't know. I didn't feel chemistry. I didn't feel like butterflies. I didn't, I wasn't, didn't feel that, that what I feel like I should feel. So I'm not going to go out with him again. And I'll say, well, why don't you just go spend, you know, another hour with this person and get to know this person and see if something develops? No, 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 no. Right. And so, but it's like, you had a good time. You, you did think, they, you know, they said, I did think he was attractive, but I didn't feel chemistry. So it's interesting because there's a study in Marry Him where it was a longitudinal study and it followed people from the time that they met their partner, like that first date, all the way through. They checked in with them every five years for, I think, 20 years. And what happened was they found that the people who were very happy together had kind of revisionist history about what it was like on their first date. So people who were really happily married said, oh yeah, I knew immediately, I felt immediate chemistry with this person. I knew this person was the one. But if you go back to what they reported at the time, often they reported at the time, yeah, nice person, not sure. Okay. So, so, but they've changed the story. They really truly believe that they felt something different, but we have data saying, no, you didn't. On the other hand, if people did not last if people are divorced, that kind of thing. Um, they will say, oh, I was never attracted to the person or I knew there were red flags in the beginning. But that's not what they reported at the time. At the time, they reported, wow, this person's amazing. So it's really interesting that people use the first date as, as like, I'm supposed to feel this one thing or else forget it. When people who are very, very happy together, totally in love, totally attracted to each other, often didn't feel those sparks on the first one, two, three dates. You know, maybe they were even friends for a while. But people don't give each other the chance to get to know the other person or to let the other person get to know you. And I think that because the apps give this illusion of, um, so many people are juggling multiple people at a time. So someone will go on a date with someone and then they'll say, yeah, that was fine. Eh, not, you know, maybe it was like a seven. So, nah. And then they, they're like, I have another date tomorrow. Or they just, they're leaving the date and they're walking to their car and they're swiping on the apps already. Because they have the illusion there's so many people out there, but if you just keep juggling people, you're never going to get to know anybody and to know if that person is someone that you want to be with. So what would you say to a serial dater then? You'd say to go on the second date, even if the person is a seven or is there, because I know, so I know people that have gone, go on hundreds of dates a year. Yep. And I think statistically they must have met someone that they would have been happy with by now. Yeah, maybe. It depends if they're making good choices about who they go on dates with. Mm -hmm. So some people will just go on dates to go on dates. Other people, if they're being really, you know, if, if they're saying, hey, this person seems like someone I would want to be with and that's who they choose to go on a first date with, then yes. But I would say the question you ask yourself at the end of a first date is, did I have a good time? The answer is yes, I would go on a second date. doesn't have to be I had a life-changing, transformative, you know, I was, uh, Cupid's arrow shot me. No, it just, did I have a good time with this person? Yeah, go on a second date, see what happens the second time. 
Who has higher expectations typically, men or women? And who is most likely or most willing to adjust their expectations? Mm. <laughs> um, I think it really depends on the person. And I think that the expectations are higher in different areas. I think for men, um, the expectations are very high around physical appearance. And, and I think for the younger generation, especially because they're growing up on all of these thirst traps that are posted on social media and they're seeing all of these girls just posting, you know, all of these really provocative pictures that have been filtered, that have been, you know, it took them 30 shots to get that one shot that they put up. And so when they see people in real life and what they really are like on a day-to-day -day basis, they have these very unrealistic expectations. And I think that's different from in the past when you saw many more people in real life than you do now where you're seeing more people online most of the time. And I think for women, the expectations are, you know, I think it's confused with feminism. So feminism is great. I'm a feminist. Um, but I think that feminism is not this person has to meet all of these criteria that are not really human. And I go through them in the book, you know, the kinds of things that people say, and I have all these surveys in the book about the kinds of things people say they're looking for and they're not finding the right person. And I talk about this study that Barry Schwartz did. He wrote The Paradox of Choice. And he looked at the difference between maximizers and satisficers. And this applies to dating as much as anything else. But, you know, the way it doesn't apply, the way that you can look at it, the way he did in his study was he said, look, if you go into a store and you want to get some jam and they have 30 different varieties, most people just leave because they can't choose. They're just, they get, they get anxious. They don't know what to pick. It's not like more is better. If you have two different choices, it's easy. You say, oh, I like this one. And you're really happy with it. The people who did choose from the 30, they're less happy because they, they're trying to maximize. And then when they taste it and they go home with it, they think, oh, I wonder what that other one would have tasted like, you know, because there were so many choices. The person who picked from one of the two is very happy with their choice. So if you look at the kind of dating analogy, it's like, I, I like to use in the book, I talk about a sweater. Say you want a sweater and you know exactly what you want. It needs to be this material so it's not itchy. This color looks good on you. This is the right size. This is the right price. This is the style you're looking for. You go into a store and you find it. The satisficer will buy it, be really happy that they found it, and really enjoy it for a very long time. The maximizer will say, oh, I found this, but while I'm at the mall, I might as well just put this one, you know, back on the, on the shelf and I will go look at a few other stores to see if I can find something that's maybe a little, like the color is a little bit better or the, the prices, maybe there's something on sale or maybe there's something that's a slightly different material and they keep looking and then they find something that's maybe slightly better in their mind and they buy it. They're less happy with it because then it took them all this anxiety and energy to find it. And then they find it and they're always looking over their shoulder. Well, maybe there's another one. Maybe there's a better one. Maybe there's a different one. And the next time they're walking and they pass a store window, they think, oh, I should have gotten that one. Mm -hmm. So maximizers think that they're putting in all the research to find the thing that's going to make them happiest. But going through that process makes them unhappy, not only by going through that process, but when they get the thing that they decide on. So with dating, we want to be satisficers, which means we have very high standards. It's not like, oh, I'm satisfied. That's enough. It's like you're satisfied because your standards are very high, but you're not always looking over your shoulder to wonder what you're missing out on. You're not always in this state of FOMO. Do you see a gender difference between satisficers and maximizers at all? Again, it depends on the person. Mm -hmm. It really does. I mean, I think that when you when when you look at the surveys in Maryham, Women do tend to be maximizers more than men, but I think that I think that men do have very high standards, but I think that men are also like after they get over the oh, I need to be with a supermodel and then they come back down to earth and they say, "Oh, I need to be with someone that I'm really attracted to," which is a different thing. They're much more holistic. Like, who do they ask the right questions? Who do I enjoy being with? And I think for women, it's, there's so many different things there. You know, in Marry Him, I talk about the things that people said they wouldn't go on a second date with somebody over. And it was like, he ordered tap water instead of sparkling water. He must be really cheap. 
you know, these assumptions that people make, like when they came by and said, which, which kind of water do you want? And maybe he's just accommodating. Maybe he just said tap water's fine. Um, or, you know, he wore this, he wore those kinds of uh, shoes with that kind of belt. He doesn't have any fashion sense. There was one where somebody said, oh, he did this impression from Austin Powers, this movie. He did this impression and it was really embarrassing and I, I, I it was so cringy. It was like, he was just nervous. He was on a first date and he was trying to make you laugh. Why don't you go on a second date? And if he does something cringy on the second date, okay, then you know. But a lot of times on a first date, people are just really nervous. So they did one thing, but the rest of the date was great. Go on another date with them. Do you think it's really that, like in the case of the like the Austin Powers impression or whatever it was, is that really the truth? Is it was it really that, or is there something else going on in their psychology where they've got commitment issues, or you know, the? Because I, I just think surely it it can't be that. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're right. I think when you really get down to it, you see that, you know, there are reasons that people will find something wrong with a partner if they are avoidant of intimacy. So you do see that. But also I, I write about in Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, one of the patients that I write about is this young woman uh, who I call Charlotte in the book. And Charlotte is somebody who is in her 20s. She's attractive and professionally successful and, um, you know, like a lovely person, but she keeps going after men who replicate her childhood. And she's not alone in that. Most of us, if we haven't really worked through whatever it was that, that we didn't get growing up or that we got too much of or not enough of, what happens is we end up seeking out the familiar. We end up, our unconscious has, our subconscious has radar for people who are like the person that hurt us in childhood because it's our experience of love. Even if it wasn't a positive experience, it's the only experience that we have had of love. And so the imprint that we have is, oh, that's love. So what happened for Charlotte was she would meet somebody and he would seem very different from her parents. Her mother was very depressed. Her father was very kind of either very present for her or then abandoning her. And um, he also drank too much and had alcohol issues. So she would find somebody. She would think, oh, this person's so different from either of my parents. Then she'd get to know him and realize, oh, wow, he drinks a lot too. Didn't realize that. Um, except her subconscious did. Like she somehow had radar for that person or this person yells a lot too, or this person is really inconsistent with me. They're either love bombing me or they're disappearing and I never know where I stand with them. That was her experience of her father. So if once she really kind of processed what happened with her family, she started going out with different kinds of people, meaning she started being attracted to different kinds of people. In that transition period, she was like, oh, I'm going out with this person, but I'm not, he seems really good for me, but I'm not really attracted to him. That was mm -hmm. because she was still attracted to sort of the father and the mother, the different qualities, the victim-y mom and the, and the unavailable mom, and then the dad who was kind of inconsistent with his availability and also his temper and his drinking. So it's interesting to see that she would date people just like that mm -hmm. without realizing it at first that she was choosing them. So I think that one thing that therapy can really do for people is to help you see why is it that you're having trouble meeting someone? Why is it that you're having trouble once you're in relationship with someone, if you get that far, maintaining that relationship or finding someone who's good for you? If you love the Diary of a CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor, become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.